what's cracking YouTube. Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nicholas, repping big dogs, gotta eat fantasy football, because that's exactly what we're getting into today. Haven't got one out since the season really ended, but I figured I'd go over some free agents. The notable free agents that are, first of all, unrestricted free agents in the NFL that will be either re-signed or looking for new landing spots in 2018. And these are obviously only the skill players, the ones that are going to affect fantasy football next year. I want to talk about the top ones at each position. I'm going to go quarterback, receiver, running back, tight end, um, kind of break down whether or not I see them re-signing with the team, where they might go, what kind of impact that will have on the landscape. So we want to get right back into this fantasy football stuff. You know, I, I'm in the playoff mood still. I mean, it was tough L from my Falcons. Don't really want to talk about that shit. I also... Uh, I also threw $100 on the Titans in the preseason during the summer. Uh, they were 40-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, so I had a lot riding on that bad boy. That didn't work out. Not a lot of things worked out for me this season, put it that way. But we're already looking forward to 2018. I hope you all had a great 2017 season, SZN. As always, if you want to support your boy, you can go grab some merch like these swaggy crewnecks that's got the logo branded on there so you can rep the set. We got the uh, the hats, I don't know, the dad hats, I don't know where they are right now, but we got pink, blue available, we got other clothes, we got all that kind of shit. If you want to support your boy, that's how you can go do that. I will link the store right there. Otherwise, we're going to get right into it. Play that funky music. Before we get into the statistics, I just want to tell you two things real quick. Fantasy football related. I've teamed up with the app called Draft, Play Draft. Some of you guys might have heard of it. It's basically a best ball, and they do season long type league drafts. It's an app on your phone. You can also do it on, on your computer, but focus that one right there. This is for you degenerates that want to draft already. Woo. You could join these best ball leagues, which is basically you, you're doing the draft and then it's like a set and forget. So you pick like a, a big roster of like 20 players or something like that. And you don't make any changes throughout the year. It just automatically plays your best players. And then you cash out at the end of the year. It automatically gives you your winnings and stuff. So it's cool. And you can enter anything from like $1 up to like, I think it goes up like $250 or something like that. It's cool because you can enter the really low hanging fruit ones like dollar leagues but people are still drafting seriously so you're getting a good idea of where players are really going in real draft so it gives you a good idea of adp they already opened up leagues for the 2018 season so if you want to deposit a dollar you want to deposit three dollars you could play a couple of the leagues and see how people are drafting already if you think you got an edge up on the competition now would be the time to take advantage of that crazy adp that people have so download the draft app you can use promo code BDGE. Promo code BDGE, that will get you a free entry into a live draft. I'm not exactly sure of the specifics, to be honest with you, but it gives you something free from your boy. You got to use BDGE to sign up for it, though. Also, if uh, if you're in a league that you guys just finished up and you're looking to get any fantasy gear, fantasyjocks.com. I have an affiliate link down below you can click. They have championship belts that are awesome. Like, I can testify to that. I was using them long before I ever partnered up with them. Championship trophies, rings, all that kind of shit. You can use my affiliate link down below and then use the promo code TAKE10 to get 10% off. So, apologize for the advertisements, but those are fantasy related and I figured you guys would like them and uh, you got a little extra with some of the BDGE promo code stuff. So, play draft, BDGE, Fantasy Jocks affiliate link is down below and you can use TAKE10 to take 10% off. All right, so we're going to break down the quarterback position first, starting in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., Kirk the Jerk Cousins. You like that? Once again, got the job done for fantasy owners in 2017. Finished as quarterback five. His second year in a row finishing as a top five fantasy quarterback. It's his third season in a row with 4,000 passing yards, 4,000 plus passing yards, and 25 plus passing touchdowns. He's averaged 4,400 passing yards, 27 passing touchdowns over the last three seasons. So a legitimate quarterback one. Now, he's played on the franchise tag. The Skins have slapped him with that tag the last couple seasons. He came out and said he's perfectly fine playing under the tag again for 2018, which would make sense considering they'd have to give him about $35 million. Yes, $35 million to keep him under the tag in 2018. So, I mean, yeah, you'd probably say yes to that, too, if you're a quarterback. Obviously, you want that financial security, but 35 mil is pretty damn secure. You know, you could lock that up in a bank account and live. You know, your, your family's going to be all right, all right? So, Kirk knows what he's doing over there. Now, he'll turn 30 this offseason, and as we know, that's still very much the prime 
time for the quarterback position, right? We got guys like Tom Brady who are 65, still playing the league and dominating with a capital Z. Um, Kirk. Now, there's a lot of speculation where he was going to go this offseason. Over the last few years, right, people thought he was going to go to San Fran. Obviously, with Jimmy the God, Garoppolo taking that city under his wings, that ain't going to happen. So we have to look elsewhere, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me um, to see them slap him with the tag again. It's it's a kind of like a win-win for both teams. The way I look at it is, one, like, I guess the salary cap matters, but realistically, like, when has money really been a huge issue for NFL owners, right? They just throw money around. That might be an ignorant statement, but maybe they feel they haven't seen enough out of Kirk yet. Maybe that extra $10 million is enough to figure out, you know, give another year to Kirk, figure out whether he's your long-term solution at the quarterback. But he's been good, right? Um, I will say, though, 2017, his lowest completion percentage, passing yards per game, yards per attempt, highest interception total over those last three years where he's seen success. So it was a little bit of a down year, but that's just statistically speaking. And there was, you know, he lost weapons on offense to Sean Jackson, Pierre Garçon, and he had to integrate all these new weapons. Um, Terrell Pryor, who was a big bust and things like that. Jordan Reed was hurt most of the year. So I'm not really looking at the statistics. That's a big, a big thing. Um, I would say the, the, the NFL, the league has a big quarterback problem right now, right? You have a lot of teams with really bad quarterbacks playing with backup quarterbacks, things like that. So I'd be shocked if if he is not the starting quarterback for the skins um when 2018 rolls around whether it's under the tag whether it's uh under a long-term <clears throat> contract their head coach jay gruden came out and, and he said he expects cousins long-term future to be addressed this offseason and to be decided upon now we'll have to see you know if those words really mean anything because i feel like we've kind of had the same conversation each of the last two off seasons so that's yet to be seen. I mean, if he returns, again, I he's he's a top eight option at quarterback fantasy-wise. Maybe you don't want to say it, but he puts the yardage up, he puts the passing touchdown totals up, and he'll be one of those guys that you can pick in the 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th round, and he will be a fine anchor to lead your team. So Kirk, I see him re-signing with the Redskins one way or another. Another guy I see re-signing with their, with their team is Drew Brees, man. This is what I'll say. Drew Brees is not taking a step back whatsoever, right? He'll be 39 next season, um, and he's, I mean, obviously he says he plans to stay. He wants to be back in New Orleans. I don't know why he would go anywhere else. I, I don't see a single possibility where he is not uh, a New Orleans Saint in 2018. You look at this team right now. You look at what happened in 2018. Uh, they have an incredible ground game between Ingram and Kamara and a much improved defense that will only get better as the continuity continues into Next season, and they gain chemistry, and they gain more of a game plan, and things like that. Those two things, a ground game and a defense, are like the exact formula for elongating a quarterback's career, right? You don't want him to take as many hits. You don't, you don't let him drop back as many times as, um, as he normally would. He only attempted 537 passes last year. That's 136 less than 2016. 136 less dropbacks than 2016. Took a lot less hits. Didn't have to do as much, right? And a lot of his dropbacks went to Kamara and Ingram um, on short passes. So he wasn't taking hits there, right? Th that was his lowest total, lowest total pass attempts since 2009. Um, and in doing this, right, Breeze set a career high in completion percentage in 2017. Had his lowest interception total ever in a Saints uniform. So... I would say, you know, like where the Saints are right now, I know they just took that L to the Vikings. Like they they could have legitimately had that one tackle been made, they could be in the Super Bowl, right? They could be beating this uh, the Eagles next week. They could be in the Super Bowl. So they're just as good as any other team in the NFL right now. With, with Breeze playing as well as he is, they have a legit two to three year window for him to get back to the Super Bowl. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they re-signed Breeze for like a three year I don't know, like $50, $50 million contract or something like that. I'm sure he's not like overly concerned about the money. Um, they're not going to slap the tag on him. They wouldn't use it on him. But there's no way he doesn't re-sign with that, right? And I will say, I do want to say also, the last fucking video I put up, the first video I put up this summer, early, it was like May or June or something, was my top five busts of the year. When I say busts, I don't think they're going to have a bad year statistically. I just think where they're getting drafted is ridiculous and you shouldn't pay the price for where the drafts were. It was also very early in the year, in the summer, 
Drew Brees was my number one guy on that list. I was like, he's gonna, he's not gonna finish where you're picking him, right? He was like going pick 50 overall, pick 55. I got a lot of shit on that. And my reasons were exactly this. They, they, they drafted a, a running back in Kamara. They signed Adrian Peterson. Obviously that didn't work out, but, but the general consensus of what I was saying made sense. Their defense has improved. They're not gonna ask him to throw as much. People are like, no, you're an idiot. And I'm like, you know what I'm like. You know how I'm feeling right now. But I expect them to get something done because I expect them to compete for the Super Bowl for the next two to three years. So Breeze will end up back there and he'll be, I, I, you also have to lower his expectations because, you know, Ingram and Kamara will be that one-two punch next year, probably. I'm assuming they're going to keep both, both running backs. Um, so he'll be a top eight option probably fantasy-wise. <clears throat> Sam Bradford, Teddy Bridgewater, Case Keenum, the Minnesota Vikings. So if you're unaware... <laughs> All three quarterbacks, this is a, a weird situation because all three quarterbacks are unrestricted free agents coming into this offseason. We'll look at Keenum first, right? And I think he's earned the BDGE stamp of respect. Respect! I'm going to do that from now on. When I respect somebody, when they earn the respect, you, you're getting that stamp right there. The stamp of respect, Keenum did it, man. He took over after Bradford got hurt, right? Bradford entered the year. You might be believe this or not, I'm old enough to remember when Sam Bradford was the starter for the Minnesota Vikings. That's how old I am. He got hurt, and uh, Keenum basically started from week two and has not lost the job since. 2018, listen to this. Keenum's 30 years old. 2018 will be just his sixth year in the NFL. He'll turn oh, he'll turn 30 in February next month, but this is obviously his first year as a full-time starter. In 15 games this year, regular season, he threw for 3,547 yards, 22 touchdowns, to seven interceptions. 22 to seven touchdown to interception ratio. He also added 160 yards and a tutty on the ground, led them most importantly to a 13 and three regular season record. Well, one of those wins is Bradford's, but you get the point. What I think is the most interesting part about Case Keenum and what I think will affect his future is the fact that he didn't, it's not like he came out of nowhere, right? I know a lot of people just wrote him off after last season, right? When he played with the Rams and it was between him and Goff kind of going back and forth, like who was the quarterback? They both were terrible when they were playing, but clearly last year was a, an anomaly for what you could expect from Goff and Keenum because they were both so bad. More or less, Keenum never really got a shot in the pros to prove what he had and what kind of quarterback he was. Um, here's what I'll say. If you're, if you're unaware of Keenum prior to this kind of breakout 2017 season, look back at college. I remember him at college. I remember him at Houston University putting up uh, in ridiculous numbers, or University of Houston, whatever it is. He threw for 5,000 passing yards in college in three separate seasons. Listen to this. He is the all-time NCAA leader in passing completions, passing yards, passing touchdowns, and total touchdowns responsible for the all-time leader in NCAA. So it's not like Keenum, you know, it's not like he was like some no-name. He was like, okay, in college, and now all of a sudden he's having like a lucky, fluky season. He had always put up the numbers, and a lot of it people weren't sure whether or not it would translate because University of Houston was one of those offenses like Oregon back in the day that just produced numbers no matter who you plugged into where, if it was wide receiver X, quarterback Y, whatever it is. Um, the raw talent and ability was always there, and now they put a legit team around them, a le lights out defense. They have crazy weapons in Adam Thielen, Stephen Diggs, Kyle Rudolph. Uh, they'll be getting Dalvin Cook back next year. You know, they should really, in my opinion, he's he should be the one that's being most looked at as the future quarterback for this team over the next few years. He's earned that. Um, so as much as you want to talk about the high upside of Teddy Bridgewater um, and what you think he might be become because he's so young. I mean, Keenum deserves a legitimate look uh, if you're the Vikings front office. I think the toughest part about um, about the decision the Vikings are going to have to make this offseason is, you know, they obviously knew it was a contract year for Teddy Bridgewater, right? But he hadn't played since 2015, so they needed to see what they had on the field with him before they entered the offseason. Unfortunately, Keenum was just playing too damn good for them to actually get that opportunity to throw Teddy in there, right? So, you know, they enter the offseason, they're like, do we re-sign him because he's a young talent with a lot of potential or do we not let him, you know, does he, do we just let him sit on the bench and we don't know and let him go? Um, you got to remember, he's just 25 years old. That is so young for a quarterback. There's still so much time for him to develop. He had, he had like two solid years coming into the NFL, right? His rookie sophomore year. They weren't great years by any means. So I, it's not like he was like Andrew Luck in his rookie year where you're like, holy shit, like they need to resign him. He's throwing up 25, 30 passing touchdowns with great accuracy and things like that. He was a game manager in his first couple seasons. Um, 
people had him pegged for this big junior season, his third year, and then he obviously had this knee injury, and now they're kind of left in no man's land. Uh, they did get him in the game in week 15 this year, one of the regular season games, when they were blowing out whoever it was, like 35, 34 to nothing. He threw two passes. Uh, one of them was an interception. It bounced off of a Vikings player's hand, so it's not really on him. Either way, it wasn't like nothing to judge from uh, off that film. And uh, it, it leaves you in a weird spot, right? And then you have Sam Bradford, who just returned to practice for the first time in about like fucking 32 years because of his knee injury. Um, so they'll actually have all three of them on the roster heading into the playoffs. I believe Bradford is the bat, the official bat. Either way, it doesn't matter. Um, Bradford is, in my opinion, probably the least likely of the three quarterbacks to end up on the Vikings roster in 2018. We, there's so many holes at the quarterback position around the NFL. Like I said, like it's a weak, it's a weak position overall for the NFL. So there's definitely a team that's going to be willing to gamble on Bradford. Like you got to remember again, I'm old enough to remember Sam Bradford being that number one pick out of Oklahoma. People loved him, right? The accuracy was unblemished. It was like all this beautiful stuff that people loved out of Bradford. And for one reason or another, it never really translated into the NFL. I mean, we've seen glimpses of it, right? Like the accuracy, he had the Wizzy, like the highest completion percentage of all time last season in the NFL. Um, but someone in the NFL will roll the dice on Bradford, and obviously the Vikings aren't going to match a contract that Bradford would get. He, uh, he He's 30 years old, uh, former number one overall pick, right? But he has, le he has some left in the tank as long as he's not injured. I will say, though, that like, that was always a big thing for him. When he first entered the league, people are just, they're like, he's not going to live up to his, the hype because he kept getting injured. Those first few years, he was never able to stay on the field. And that's another, you know, part of the, the picture when it comes to Bradford. So if you're a team that's willing to invest a lot into him, you have to know that the injury risk is real and it, you know, it, it could happen to him again. So that's why I think the Vikings are definitely the least likely. They have Keenum who, who proved it this year and they have Bridgewater who's five years younger than Bradford and has you know, just as much potential or upside as Bradford probably has at this point in his career. So no point on, on gambling on Bradford. I will say it'll, it'll, hard, it'll be hard for the Vikings to retain even two of them. Like, you think Bridgewater is going to want to sit behind Case Keenum? Probably not. You think the Vikings are going to be able to match an offer for Bridgewater? Eh, we don't know. You know. I could see Teddy Bridgewater ending up somewhere else, like maybe the, the Jets, right? Why not? If you're the Jets, right, rather than continually using all your draft picks on quarterbacks that haven't developed for either coaching reason or one reason or another, why not get a guy like Teddy Bridgewater, sign him to a contract. You've seen him. You have film of him NFL wise. Obviously you make, you go through the, the, the right screening process to make sure he's okay health wise and everything, but you have at least film on, you have film, right? You have tape of him. You've seen what he could be and you see the potential there. So rather than investing a first round pick, use that on a position player, get your boy Teddy Bridgewater on the roster He's 25. He has so much time to develop into a real quarterback. So, um, I don't know. That's what I would say. The way I'd see this playing out is Case Keenum is the Vikings quarterback in 2018. I see Bradford definitely somewhere else. And I see Teddy Bridgewater, I would say, 75% to 85% probably somewhere else too. So, I like Keenum as a, uh, you know, a lot of weapons there. So, he could definitely be a top 12 fantasy option next year. As for the other two, I probably wouldn't. I would be staying away from them uh, fantasy-wise. So that is the quarterbacks. Wow. Do me a favor. Do me a big, 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 big favor. If you're enjoying the video thus far, just scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up button, guys, because that's how YouTube's like, damn, people like your video. We're going to show it to other people. And thus, other people find my channel. More subscribers. The more subscribers, the more motivation I have. The more motivation I have, the more videos I'm going to get out to y'all people, right? It's just a it's a circle. Circle of life. Yeah, so anyways, just go give it that thumbs up because I would appreciate the shit out of that. If you're new to the channel, go subscribe, obviously. And uh, you know what? Leave a comment down below what other kind of fantasy videos, what other kind of videos overall you want to see from the channel all off season. Because, you know, I do other shit besides fantasy. I do my vlog every Saturday of me starting my marketing business, just all the behind the scenes kind of stuff. So tune into that if you think I'm... Uh, cool guy. You'll probably enjoy those vlog videos. I do some shoe reviews, some tech reviews, things like that. But let me know what you'd like to see. And uh, we'll get back into this fantasy foosball stuff. Starting with the wide receivers, Sammy Watkins, Los Angeles Rams. Um, what an incredible turn of events for this guy. He's in Buffalo, right? Him and Bobby Woods, boys. They both go from Buffalo to LA. And uh, everyone kind of assumed 
that this was like the death shot, the kill shot to, to both of these guys, at least short-term career, right? You're going from Buffalo with at least a decent quarterback in Tyrod Taylor to what we had known from last year of Jared Goff as the worst quarterback in the league. Now, this is, this is a case in which people are going to be able to kind of learn from and be like, we shouldn't judge so quickly, right? You say, everyone's like, Jared Goff is horrible this year. He looks amazing. And uh, that's something that, you know, people are going to be hesitant to be very quick to judge on quarterbacks from now on. And, and teams should take the same approach. But um, this couldn't have worked out better for the former Clemson wideout, Sammy Watkins. Goff turned out to be, you know, what we saw of him, right? The, uh, the unquestioned franchise leader there in, in Los Angeles. And uh, you now have him and Sean McVay at the helm of this franchise, and it looks like they're going to be doing some serious shit for years to come, right? They went from literally the worst scoring offense in the league last year, 14 points per game in 2016, to the highest scoring one in 2017, nearly 30 points per game. I didn't fact check this, but I could probably guarantee you without looking at it that no team has went from the lowest scoring offense to the highest scoring offense in a change of a year. I feel like this that's like monumental low key. And uh, we're just used to seeing so much crazy shit nowadays that that hasn't really registered. But, oh, man. Oh, man. Some crazy stuff out there, man. So, uh, Sammy Watkins finished this year as <clears throat> their wide receiver two, arguably three with Cooper Cup. Finished with 39 catches, 593 receiving yards, eight touchdowns. Not a great statistical line, but the eight touchdowns are obviously very encouraging. He scored six touchdowns in their last eight games. And uh, the, the problem is he never he went over 70 receiving yards only twice this year. So it's an offense that's definitely going to spread the ball around, right? It's, it's an offense that gets a lot of guys involved between Gurley, um, Gurley's carries, Gurley's receptions, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, Sammy Watkins. And uh, I, I think what we saw is that, like, Robert Woods kind of became what we thought Sammy Watkins was going to be and vice versa. <clears throat> so uh, they re-signed Robert Woods to, or they, they extended his contract, I think, like, four years, $45 million, something like that. You're going to have to fact check me on that. But clearly they really like Woods there. So he's going to be a big part of that offense and probably the wide receiver one, if not maybe share that with uh, Watkins going forward. It's crazy because, like, what sucks, I feel bad for the Chargers, right? Both teams moved to L.A. You have um, the fan base is probably split up, right? L.A. fan base is there. They're chilling. They're like, <clears throat> Where? we got two, two good, uh, not two good teams, but two new teams coming to the city. It's like, how do you decide who you want to root for? And obviously, this couldn't have worked out better for the Rams. They moved there, young quarterback, great offense. They have the future of the franchise, like, pegged, and people are super excited about them in this city. Um, now the Chargers are on the opposite end, right? You got Phillip Rivers, who's like 47. He's going to be retiring within the next probably three, four years. And the Chargers, just, they haven't won anything in, in a long time. So that whole city probably shifts to, to being Rams fans. Now, I would, <clears throat> I would be shocked if Watkins wanted to leave that. I would also be shocked if the Rams wanted Watkins to leave. Although they do have, you know, Woods' contract on the books. I think they still have Tavon Austin's contract on the books, that big one he got a couple years ago. So that should be interesting to see if that has an effect on this. Um, ESPN Rams reporter Alden Gonzalez expects the team to slap Watkins with that franchise to zag, um, which is, I, I think that's a good, a good idea. What I would say is he's still 24. Watkins is still 24 years old. Bah, bah, God, 24. That, he's younger than me. That's absurd. It's absurd. It's insanity. Made the beat that murdered it, Casey Anthony. So he's 24. You might as well slap him with the franchise tag, see how this offense goes again. You know, if they think they need him by, by next summer, then they could re-sign him to like a three- or four-year deal. If not, then they can let him go. But I think the franchise tag is definitely worth it in, the, in this, uh, with what they have there. Why not keep it going, see, see how far they could take this offense. So I expect Sammy Watkins to be on the Rams again next year. Um, I expect him to probably be like a, Probably between a fifth and seventh round pick, you know, because I, I, he'll probably have more consistency on the receiving yard side of things. And uh, I mean, I guess the upside is there too. So I would be okay. I would be okay taking Watkins probably in the fifth or sixth round, but probably nothing more than that because we saw how um, how much they spread the ball around. So the upside is there. I would say the consistency is something that you have to be aware of. But you know, I like I like Watkins. 
Next up, we have Allen Robinson of the Jaguars. You know, about 13 seconds into the 2017 season. And honestly, this is probably my fault. I apologize for choosing him in the E-Town get down round eight or is it the round nine draft because that basically means if I draft him in that league, that means that he's tearing his ACL. Uh, so that's my bad for anyone that picked Allen Robinson because I definitely was the reason that that happened. Um, towards ACL really quickly into that first game. I actually remember the 17 yard catch. I was pumped up. I was like, boom, we had 2.2 points already from my boy. And, uh, and then he goes down out for the entire season. He had an incredible 2015 season, uh, prefaced a disappointing 2016 season. And I was really expecting a bounce back. Now I would be shocked if Allen Robinson ends up back with the Jaguars, right? You could see where this team is going. They invested super, super, super duper heavy money into their defense, signing all these guys in free agency, and obviously the run game investing in Leonard Fournette in the top 10 pick. And uh, they have, they already have some pretty good young talent at wide receiver between Marquise Lee, D.D. Westbrook, Keelan Cole, and those are all for you know inexpensive players, obviously. So I, I don't see I don't see a point in re-signing Allen Robinson from the Jaguars. Maybe a franchise tag thing, but I haven't really looked into that. Allen Robinson says he expects to be healthy and able to pass a physical before free agency opens in March. Um, Roto World says that he is looking for something similar to Devontae Adams' deal with the Packers, four years, $58 million. I think that's a risky deal for a team to make with Allen Robinson. Um, he missed all of last year. He had a super disappointing 2016 season. And when you look at the splits, um, all of his big games, all of his good games came against bad cornerbacks. So it's not even like he had all of this year to practice against Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Bowie, right? So it's like, it, you know, the, the, the talent is, is immense, right? I mean, the upside is crazy. He's just 24 years old. Um, I think he'll turn 25 in August. Shout out August babies. So the upside is crazy, right? And you saw it in 2015. But again, that being said, he missed all of last year, a disappointing year before that. And he just doesn't dominate top flight cornerbacks. So it's tough to say whether he, he's not a guy like when you sign a guy to that big of a contract, you want him to be a game breaker, game changer. You want him to take over. You know, you, you want him to take you over the edge as a wide receiver and a wide out. You want a guy like Julio who could break out and, and beat the Saints for you, right? One-on-one -on -one games, you want to be able to beat the Saints because Julio broke out. I'm not sure you have that in Allen Robinson outside of, like, big number games against bad wider, uh, bad cornerbacks. Wherever he ends up, though, I think uh, he could still definitely have that high wide receiver two upside in fantasy football. I think he'll end up getting picked around the same spot in fantasy drafts this summer as he did last summer. And I think that was around like four or five. And it obviously, it depends on where he ends up. Uh, but he can definitely still be a wide receiver one on a team, statistically speaking. High end wide receiver two, fantasy wise. Uh, I was looking at some of the, the ADP numbers right now, fantasy football calculator. To where this is coming from. He's picked 52, right behind Demarius Thomas and ahead of Michael Crabtree. So I'd probably flip that order. I'd probably pick Crabtree, Allen Robinson, Demarius Thomas, obviously depending on where they land up and where they end up and who the quarterbacks are in those in those places. But you can see around pick 52. So um, exactly where I'd expect him to go. You know, he's looking for that big deal, but like when I originally wrote this article before I before I saw that that's what he was looking for, I thought he was going to get one of those like one year prove it type deals, right? That Alshon Jeffrey got, that Terrell Pryor got this offseason. And uh, I mean, it would be smart for a team to do that as opposed to offering him a big contract. But you never know because teams are desperate to fill these wide receiver spots, right? But I mean, like, it, it, it's such a gamble with some of these wide receivers between injuries and, you know, just busting out, right? You look at, I mean, Alshon Jeffrey worked out, but at the same time, uh, Terrell Pryor, uh, like thank God the the uh, the Redskins didn't give him like a four year forty million dollar deal, right? Because they would be like, fuck, now we're stuck with him and he sucks. And uh, I just think it'd be smarter for a team to do that rather than give him that four year fifty million dollar contract. Some interesting landing spots. I think the Colts would be freaking sick to see uh, him outside with Ty Hilton and hopefully Andrew Luck is back. Um, I think 49ers would be an awesome fit too with Jimmy Grout. They're both really young. They can they can gather that chemistry together. They need some outside weapons there. Um, maybe the Browns. They have a lot of cap space. I don't think it would ever happen, but the Chiefs would be pretty cool too. Imagine Allen Robinson on one side, Tyreek Hill on the other side. That would be a dope combo. Um, that would be a very, very cool offense. Also, yeah, like I said, I don't know what their cap situation looks like, and they're not really ones for signing big uh, wide receivers and free agency, but... 
I don't know. Those are just a couple teams off the top of my head that I could see Allen Robinson signing with and, and kind of making a, a big impact. And uh, speaking of Terrell Pryor, um, you know, he signed that one-year prove-it deal, and he did the opposite of prove it. He, he disproved it. He disproved the people that were in love with him. Finished the year with 20 catches, 240 yards, and a touchdown. Um, he went on to the IR later in the year, uh, underwent ankle surgery. I'm sure he'll be healthy by the time free agency rolls around. Signed him to a one-year, $6 million deal. And uh, that's probably around what we're going to see him sign for again, somewhere probably outside of Washington. I, I would be shocked if they re-signed him uh, to a deal again after seeing you know what they went through this year. Oh, sorry, y'all. My camera died. Finished filming the Terrell Pryor and the Jarvis Landry piece, and then I realized it was dead. But... We're gonna continue on. I think I was saying, uh, Terrell Pryor will probably get another one year approved deal, right? He got the one year $6 million deal in Washington. There's no way, well, in my opinion, there's no way they re sign him after seeing what they saw from him this year. I think it would actually be kind of interesting to see him go back to the Browns, right? Hear me out. Throw Flash, throw Josh on the outside, let him kind of eat up those cornerback uh, ones. Throw Terrell Pryor on the other side, right? He's already been there. He's already comfortable. He's run in the Hugh Jackson offense. Let him run outside with Flash, and then let Corey Coleman man the slot because that's a, that's a, that's a position that Corey Coleman could dominate. And before you know, it, you got three pretty good outside pieces. I mean, depending on how you see Pryor, if you think he's a total bust and he's you know he's he should be out of the league, then that's one thing. But I mean, he's still relatively young at age 28, right? And um, He's just a year removed from that 1,000-yard season in Cleveland. And, I mean, that was obviously a, a volume-based statistic, right? He had 140 or more than 140 targets uh, in that 1,000-yard season. And I, the big the big argument was like, oh, well, he had 140 targets. He had 1,000 yards. Take some of those targets off in Washington, but they're going to be more efficient targets. And that's just something you learn, right? You shouldn't be basing it off just statistics, and you can't just, like, throw player X in here and player Y in here and expect things to happen over there, but that's something we learn as fantasy owners, right? So uh, I think it'd be interesting for Terrell Pryor to go back to Cleveland if they see it fit. Otherwise, I'm sure he'll get a chance somewhere else, but it will be another prove-it deal. And, uh, I mean, anywhere he goes, he's, he's not going to be anything more than, like, a, a deep late-round flyer for fantasy purposes in 2018. And we <clears throat> move to the last wide receiver on my list, and that's Jarvis. Jarvis Landry at down in my Miami. Welcome to Miami. Now Jarvis, like every season they have reports and there's rumors that they're looking to trade him by the deadline, right? And he's been one of the most consistent pieces on this offense. Unbelievable. I'm pissed. He's been one of the most consistent pieces on this offense over the last three, four years. And uh, he did what he normally does, right? He, he averaged 8.8 yards per reception, which is one of the worst numbers statistically in the NFL. But he also led the NFL in catches, 112. So that's not easy to do, right? The yards per reception suck. But if you're going to catch the most balls in the NFL and you're going to pick up nine yards every single time you catch a ball, I'm sure teams will take it. So he's been super consistent. But at the same time, he's not. I mean, he also had the, uh, the touchdown upside this year, right? He scored nine touchdowns. And he's only scored four each of the last two years. So that was uh, a little bit of a breakout. We'll have to see if that's an anomaly or not. But that's not a part of the field where he scored touchdowns that we've seen him normally do his thing over the last few years. I would say, though, he's not like a game-changing guy. Those slot receivers, it's so hard to really like respect them and and not just say, like, hey, we could probably fit in someone else who's super athletic and he can put up the same type of numbers, right? So he's not a guy, like, when you're competing with the Patriots and you're, I mean, they're not even competing with the Patriots, but you get what I'm saying. When you're trying to put your team over the edge and, and make that big jump, I don't think Jarvis Landry is the guy that's really going to do it for you, right? You need a wide receiver that's going to break a game out and, and make plays where you can be like, holy shit, at any given point, he could break out and, and we could win a game because of him. And I just don't think that's what you get from Jarvis Landry. He is just 25 years old. He wants to stay in Miami. He said, I, I think they've opened up contract talks already and they want to extend him. But like, I feel like it'd be stupid for them to give him a Devontae Adams type deal, right? A four year, $58 million thing to a guy who's not, <clears throat> not even really like a wide receiver one. He's not going to, um, do a lot of the things that guys like Devontae Adams or any wide receiver one would really be able to do. So I think it'd be good to keep him around, but only at the right price. This is an interesting stat from Jason Lezier of Palm Beach Post. He and Odell Beckham share the league's all-time record for most catches in the first three years of a career, and he's the only Dolphin ever to catch 100 passes in a season. So 
Chuck, stamp of respect from my man Jarvis Landry. I mean, I like the dude. I think he's cool. I think he's got some swag. Him and Odell were boys back in college at LSU, so it'd be cool to see them team up. It'll never happen, just how their teams are constructed right now. But it'd be pretty cool. It'd be swaggy. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the at the end of this, I would say that I, I do see Jarvis Landry resigning with Miami. I think it, it it'll take a while for them to reach. An agreement on it because I think he's probably going to want a lot more money than they're they're willing to give him, and I'd probably side with the, the the team on this one. But he'll be back as usual as a wide receiver two PPR. He's shown that consistently. I, I would bring my touchdown expectations down to probably around five or six again next year and go back down to the norm. But you know he's there wide receiver two PPR wide receiver three in other formats. That's just what it is. You know what you're getting from Jarvis. And we move over to, before we do that, again, guys, please go give it that thumbs up. If you're enjoying the video, if I helped you, if I entertained you, if you are if you think you're better looking than me, go give that a thumbs up. I should have a thumbs up for every single viewer that I have. Can I get your number? Can I get it? All right. All right. All right. Let's buckle down now. Let's buckle down, big dog country. Moving all the running backs. We got a good slate, man. We got Lev Bell. We got Carlos Hyde. We got Frank Gore. We got both. The New England running backs, Burkhead, Deion Lewis. We got Isaiah Crowell. I don't remember if I said him or not, but we got some good ones on the slate. So go give it that thumbs up. I'm going to wait here for like five seconds. All right, cool. We can talk about Le'Veon Bell now. Now, uh, Bell destroyed his contract season, right? In a good way. So good for him. Respect it because he's the best running back in the game right now. And uh, I'll get more into his... His, his stats and his numbers and stuff when I do, I'm gonna do a first round mock draft. It's probably gonna be the next video I do. So a 2018 first round mock draft. I feel like my face be looking all crazy with the lights on in here. Um, look like a ghost kinda. Yeah, when I do the first round mock draft, I'll definitely get into more stats and numbers. So expect that within the next week or two. And uh, if you wanna see that, go give the video a thumbs up and I'll know that you wanna see it. He played under the franchise tag this year. He made a little over $12 million. Now, the Steelers could do it again in 2018, but they'd have to pay him around $15 million. And, you know, they've made it loud and clear that they don't want to do that, obviously, right? He turned down a four-year $12 million contract last season. Uh, he wants to be in the mid-14s to $15 million a year group, which is, not, which is not even a group. It would just be him by himself there. You look at Devontae Freeman, right? He just got that extension. He's getting paid like $8.5 million a year. So, when you look at that, it's like, when we can get a Devonta Freeman for eight and a half million, should we pay Le'Veon Bell for 15 million? Bell just came out and said, he will consider sitting out the 2018 season or retiring if franchise is tagged for the second consecutive year. He must have heard that the fake news awards were on next Thursday. I'm not even gonna entertain that actually. There's a 0% chance he sits out this year or retires. He's like 26 years old. Like shut, shut your face, Le'Veon Bell. As much as I love you and respect you, you ain't getting the stamp of respect right now. This is just absurd. And what I was gonna say prior to the reports coming out these last few days after the Steelers lost is I think whether or not Big Ben came back for 2018 was gonna play kind of a large role in this, but he's already said Big Ben is coming back for 2018, which I'm pretty surprised about because it took him a while to decide that in 2017, and I didn't think he was going to come back this year because he was very close to retiring last summer. Now he's he coming bike, he coming bike. It's come bike season, right? Johnny Manziel. Every every off season's come bike season. And uh, anyways, what I was gonna say is with Ben coming back, of course, they're a Super Bowl contender again, like every year. And I, I doubt the Steelers want to play the next season without Le'Veon Bell. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they slapped him with the franchise tag. And I can't imagine a player who's that good and who loves the game as much as Le'Veon Bell does that he'll actually sit out. Whether or not they get him for a long-term deal, whether or not they tag him, he's obviously still an elite running back in fantasy. He is my number one overall pick for 2018. Say what you want. If you want to take Gurley, do your thing. I'll take Le'Veon Bell there wherever he ends up. I definitely expect it to be with the Steelers, but you know, we'll have to see. We'll talk about some more pressing issues, guys that might actually move, and that's Carlos Hyde of the 49ers, right? This is an interesting one. There's a lot of talk about Hyde in the offseason, about how he wasn't going to even be on the 49ers and shit like that. A lot of erroneous ass reports. Y'all, you reporters gotta check yourselves, first of all, without like saying dumb shit like that and having no repercussions. But I said all offseason, I was like, Carlos Hyde's the guy. He's going to be the workhorse there. He's too good, and he's proven it, right? The numbers don't lie when it comes to Carlos Hyde about how good he's been. I'm, I'm talking about from an efficiency standpoint, especially with the weapons that surrounded him. And now he's got Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo, their, their future. Also, I want to say, right, there's going to be a lot of other moves, guys that maybe get cut or released, and, and they'll become 
free to sign with other teams and there's restricted free agents such as like Josh Gordon who I'm not getting into in this list because I'm only talking about unrestricted guys who could sign wherever they want do whatever they want so that's what this list is and that's where Carlos Hyde falls finished as running back eight in PPR fantasy leagues this year he had a touch less than 300 299 touches 10 yards shy of 1400 total yards to go along with eight touchdowns that's very impressive I think it'd be very very smart for them to bring Hyde back here He's just 27, he'll turn 28 in September. And when you have a guy like Jimmy Garoppolo, and what I mean by that is you have a guy that you're expecting to win games for you. You're expecting to keep you in games. You need a guy like Carlos Hyde. You need a grinder. You need someone that can play in between the tackles. And uh, you look at like the Saints, right? Drew Brees, they have that Mark Ingram type back. And I would compare Hyde and Ingram very similarly in terms of build, in terms of they're both powerful, but they're also both capable of having a lot of, you know, finesse to him, as well as being able to receive out of the backfield. So you need a grinder like Hyde who could run in between tackles and take some of the pressure off Jimmy G and let that game plan kind of develop how they want to uh, see it develop. And you look at um, you look at Hyde's numbers with and without Garoppolo under center, and he's averaged nearly three carries more per game with Garoppolo under center than without him. Uh, of course, that could be attributed to game script and how, you know, Jimmy G led them to a lot of wins down the stretch and they, they were winning and they needed to kill the clock. But that's what I'm saying. You need a guy like Carlos Hyde. If you're expecting to be winning, you need someone that can grind it out and take a lot of carries and take a lot of hits and things like that. So it, I think it'd be a little ridiculous for them to just get rid of Carlos Hyde and expect Matt Breida or like Joe Williams to be able to carry the load there. So like I mentioned, the Saints, right, they have Kamara as that one-two punch and the Niners sort of had that already. If they if they keep around Carlos Hyde between between Matt Breida and between Joe Williams coming back next year off the IR, who Kyle Shanahan loves, and we all know that that script, they'll have a one-two punch there. So I think it's really smart for them to to kind of develop a game plan like that, right? You have Kyle Shanahan who did that with the Falcons. Now Jimmy G is their Matt Ryan. You have Carlos Hyde as their Devonta Freeman, and Tevin Coleman is like the Joe Williams or Matt Breida. So it's kind of developing the same offense that they already had. So I would be surprised if they got rid of Carlos Hyde. If he ends up back with the Niners, I think he's a very viable top 10 fantasy option again. I think he's going to get, you know, 17 to 20 carries a game with a few receptions mixed in here and there. And uh, if he doesn't go, if he goes elsewhere, I think it will get interesting. It'll, it'll, he's actually, I think he's less likely, like his landing spot is less likely to determine his, his fantasy relevance. I think he's one of those guys that no matter where he ends up, he's going to be the high volume back in that offense. So he is, he's probably a high end RB2 regardless of where he ends up, but I would like to see him stay in San Fran. And then we got Isaiah Crowell. This guy just turned 25. Like, I think it was like yes or like last week. So Happy birthday to my mans, Isaiah Crowell. Welcome to your 25 year. Welcome to your Mark McGuire year, my mans. Maybe we can hang out sometime if you watch this video. We can celebrate our birthdays or some shiz. A lot of people pegged Isaiah Crowell and like to have his breakout year this year, right? He had two couple good years, a few good years in his belt, and now they're like, he's gonna he gonna enter the upper echelon. Oh wait, upper echelon. That's a good song by that Travis Scott, Big Sean, and I haven't heard that in a long time. I gotta put that on my Spotify playlist. Also, if you need Spotify playlists for workout, for beach, for just for Darty Marks, you can follow me on Spotify. I think my username is NAE825. NAE825. I think all my playlists are public, so you can follow that if you need some jams. I don't even remember how I got to that. What was the fuck was I saying? Oh, so people expected him to enter the upper echelon, and he took a step back in basically every single statistical category. So if you took him at your, like your third, fourth round pick, he bit the shit out of you. We'll put it that way. Um, with, with a guy like Crowell, though, who's shown he could be a real NFL running back, like a very high utilized NFL running back, he's not in the elite class. So I think wherever he ends up, I think like where I said Carlos Hyde, regardless of where he ends up, he's going to be a very big fantasy factor. I think where Crowell ends up is going to be the biggest factor in where in uh, in what he can produce fantasy wise in 2018. I personally don't expect to see him back with the Cleveland Browns next year. Because you look at what they have in terms of draft picks, right? They have the number one overall pick. They have the number four overall pick. Then they have the 33 and 35. So basically like late first round, really early second round picks. Um, along with the 60 and 65 overall pick. And uh, I think a lot of people have this consensus of them taking a running back early, like Saquon Barkley, with one of those top two picks. And, uh, and either a quarterback with one of them, or trade back and grab a quarterback later over two of those picks, but I just think they have so much draft capital, and this is a very, 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 very good running back class, and I'll get into, like, 
when, when the draft starts rolling around more, I'll do some videos on that. But this is, if you're unaware, this is one of the best running back classes, supposedly, that we've seen in a very, very long time. So I would be surprised if they banked on Crowell doing anything further than what he did this year so they, they can invest in, into a Saquon Barkley if they wanted to. And I think Crowell will land elsewhere. Now, there will definitely be interest in Crowell from a lot of the teams around the league. Like I said, he's just 25 years old, just turned 25. He has four individual productive seasons under his belt, three of them with over 200 touches. He hasn't missed a single game yet in those four years. He hasn't missed a single game. Now, durability is always something teams are looking for, right? If not from a fantasy football perspective, from a real-life NFL perspective, you need a guy like Crowell who can run in between the tackles, who can, uh, you know, run the clock down. So if he goes to a winning team, maybe imagine like, actually, no, that's stupid because I'm about to talk about Deion Lewis and Rex Burkhead, but I can see Crowell going like the Patriots and being like the Mike Gillisley. Well, all right, you know what I meant though. Maybe something like Frank Gore leaving the Colts and Crowell taking that spot if Andrew Luck comes back. That could be some heavy duty shit. Speaking of Frank Gore, here we are. He's an unrestricted free agent. A, an un, a URFA, baby. So Gore said uh, he would definitely be interested in coming back to the Colts if Andrew Luck is healthy. And I think he's warranted that. Like he is more than capable of saying something like that to the press or to a team because he's, well, first of all, he's old as shit, right? Turns 35 in May. But who, who knows at this point, right? He had almost exact exactly the same numbers this year as he did in 2016, as he did in 2015, as you see by this screenshot. See, 16 games played, hasn't missed the game. The next number is carries, rushing yards, yards per carry, rushing touchdowns, targets, receptions, receiving yards, yards per reception, and receiving touchdowns. It was his lowest touch total overall, yards per carry number, rushing and receiving yards total, and touchdown total. So it was a little bit of a down year for Frank Gore, but I mean, he did he did what, he, what you kind of expected him to do, right? They still utilized him a lot more than Marlon Mack, even down the stretch and even in the latter part of the season, which I'm not really sure why, because we've seen Mack have success when they finally give him give him the ball, right, and let him do his thing. What I will say is the Colts, uh, Jim Ursay came out and said that he hopes that the team uses a high pick on a running back. They have the third overall pick in the draft this year. So again, same thing I said with the Browns. There's a lot of speculation that the Colts will use that number three pick on a guy like Saquon Barkley, which I could totally see happening. I think that would be dope as hell. That'd be super interesting. Um, if Saquon goes to the Colts and Luck is healthy and Luck is there, uh, he's going to be an RB1 in fantasy, and he's probably going to be ranked between, for me, I'll rank him somewhere between RB6 and RB8 prior to the draft next season. So that'd be cool. Uh, but I also would like to see Marlon Mack get a fair shot at proving himself. Last year, he only had, in 2017, he had three games with double-digit touches. They only gave him three games with double-digit touches. In those three games, he put up over 200 yards of total offense between reception and carries. And in those three games, he scored three times. Like, he's productive when given the ball, right? He's the big, I know a lot of people like to throw out that stat, like, he has, uh, his every carry either goes for 20 plus yards or negative five yards, but like, it's an easy stat to pull out when you don't get a lot of touches, you don't get a lot of carries. I, I, I really hope that they give him like a legitimate shot to prove something next year. It wasn't super efficient, just 3.8 yards per carry, but that was still better than Frank Gore's 3.7 yards per carry uh, behind an awful line, an awful O line without Andrew Luck. I mean, you could easily see that number go up to 4.2, 4.4 yards per carry next year if they give him the ball. Plus he's got that home run ability. So, I mean, I still think there's plenty of upside when it comes to Marlon Mack, but um, it should be interesting to see. I don't see Frank Gore ending back up with the Colts. I think they're gonna look to move on to younger crop of running back and see if they could really turn something out with Andrew Luck as long as he's healthy next year. It's a big if, obviously, considering all the reports that are coming out about him. The last two running backs, both Patriots running backs. We got Dion, Lou God, and Flex Goathead. The Pats just simple and plain. The Pats just know what they're doing at the running back position. This is the thing I don't understand. Like people wonder why the Pats are so good, right? Bill Belichick, Tom Brady. They're just ahead of the curve in terms of overall philosophy of football. You want to talk about a copycat league? Patriots throw the ball more than any other team in the league, right? And they've done so for the last five years because they understand that the NFL is a passing game. It's a passing league now. And if you're still trying to run the ball, Obviously, you can have success, but the trend is you got to be passing the ball more, and they just simply know how to do that. They're recycling running backs, and what they did was find 
two guys in Deion Lewis and Flex Burkhead that can do all three downs. They can run in between the tackles, they can run outside, they can block, they can catch, they're shifty, they can do whatever you need to do. So they're kind of interchangeable in that sense. Um, look at some of the numbers. Deion Lewis, 1,100 total yards, nine touchdowns, only touched the ball 212 times. RB 13 overall in fantasy this year, despite getting only five touches a game over the first five games. So he barely, they barely use him over the first five games, still wound up as RB 13 in fantasy. If you take out weeks one to three, Deion Lewis is fantasy football's running back seven. From weeks nine to 17, he's running back five. The last four weeks of the season, running back three. He secured that feature role for the Pats down the stretch. Um, they were using him as a workhorse with Burkhead as a compliment. Only 12 running backs had more carries than Lewis from week 15, uh, from week five on. And then we look at Rex Burkhead, played it in just 10 games, but he scored eight touchdowns in those 10 games. Uh, eight touchdowns on 94 touches. That's a touchdown like every 11 touches. Um, he didn't even have a double digit touch game until week eight. And he missed weeks 16 and 17 along with their playoff game with an injury he's still dealing with. It uh, doesn't matter, but over the last six weeks of the season, or the, over his last six weeks of the season, because he didn't play in 16 and 17, from weeks 10 to 15, he was running back nine in uh, PPR leagues for fantasy. So both of them are eaten, right? And you see, you found a formula that, that that's working for the Patriots. And uh, I mean, you could say that every year, I guess, but what I'm saying is both both these guys are interchangeable to, to themselves. And uh, they made Gillisley and they made James White irrelevant with them being able to push on the goal line and them being able to catch the ball. And this is rare for me to say because it's almost impossible to predict what the Pats will do on a year-over-year -year basis with the running backs and free agency and things like that. But I would be legitimately surprised if they didn't lock up both guys, Deion Lewis and Rex Burkhead, this offseason for at least like, you know, uh, not a crazy contract, but like two years, uh, maybe give both guys like four to five million and keep both those guys around. Both guys are 27 years old. Both guys have NFL experience. Both guys have immense talent, immense versatility and it's just something that the Pats look for those three things right talent experience versatility um, I think if those two guys come back right and that's the game plan the same game plan they've basically had over the last half of the season I think both guys can be RB2 RB3s again in 2018 for the Patriots and if they leave uh, it's hard to say either guy will be used as well as the Pats use them this year I would love to see Deion Lewis used as a feature back somewhere else. Um, I mean, I would love it even more if he stayed with the Patriots and was used as a feature back. But like I said, the game plan changes so quick. I think he's probably my favorite player in the NFL. And I've been saying this, like I said it last offseason too, like Deion Lewis is incredible. Like when you watch him play, it's like jaw dropping sometimes. You put him in the open field, he's second to none at making guys miss. Anyways, what was I saying? Don't tell Julio Jones I said that either, by the way, about Deion Lewis being my favorite p player in the NFL. I would say if both of them get re-signed, Lewis should be a fourth-round pick in fantasy drafts next year. Obviously, the injury concern is there, but I think the upside is crazy, which we've seen over the last few weeks. I think Burkhead's going to be one of the safest. I think Burkhead will actually, if they both get re-signed, Burkhead will probably be the fantasy play because... One, he's going to get used, right? He's going to catch a lot of balls, and he's he'll probably go around like round seven or eight. But he also has crazy upside because there will be games where they give him a lot of goal line carries. And Lewis, if he gets hurt, Burkhead will get a 15-plus touch workload week over week. So I, I really hope both of them get re-signed. Um, but if they don't, it's going to be weird to see where they go or how they're used in other situations. So we shall see. That's the running backs. We have three tight ends I want to go over. That is Jimmy Graham, Tyler Eifert, Trey Burton. Jimmy Graham had a good year, right? 10 touchdowns, uh, but he only had 520 receiving yards, which were his lowest total receiving yards since his rookie season back in 2010. Now, supposedly reports are saying it's really unlikely that Graham resigns with Seattle. I don't know exactly why that's the case, but okay, sure, we're going to roll with that. Um, interesting landing spots for Graham. <sighs> How about this team down in New Orleans? Can we see a reuniting of Jimmy Graham and Drew Brees? Do you remember when Jimmy Graham was, I'm old enough to remember when Jimmy Graham was on the Saints and he rivaled Rob Gronkowski year in and year out for that tight end one spot in fantasy. I would love to see that happen. Now, how about San Fran? How about Dallas with Witten kind of on his way out? How about the Texans with Deshaun Watson, right? 
Um, honestly, I feel like there's like 90 fucking teams that could that would be a good fit for Jimmy Graham. But he'll turn 32 in November next year. Wow, he got old real quick. But uh, generally, tight ends can play late into their career. He still looks pretty good, more or less. He definitely is a red zone threat. They obviously don't utilize him as much as the Saints did back in the day. But still talented, still looks healthy, still looks good to go. So if he re-signs with Seattle, I mean, again, he'll probably be like a, a lower tight end one. A guy that you'd feel good about getting later in the draft. And he'll, he'll put up those good weeks. And he has a high touchdown ceiling and things like that. Um, if he goes back to the Saints, I'd expect him to be shooting up draft boards and people are going to love Jimmy Graham and buy into it. And I think I'll be one of those guys that buys into that as well. Because Kobe Fleener just sucks, to be honest with you. Like, I don't know how many years in a row people can be like, hey, this is the year. Like, no. Jimmy Graham going back to the Saints, I think, would make him a top five tight end in fantasy again. And, uh, yeah, whatever. Tyler Eifert. Tyler Eifert has played in just 39 of a possible 80 games since arriving in the Cincinnati Bengals facility in 2013. Including just two this year. Um... 10 over the last two seasons. Now, the Bengals have not been r ruled out. They didn't rule out the possibility of re-signing him, which might be his best bet. Um, there can't be a team out there willing to sign him for a big contract. There's no shot. I can't imagine it. He's had multiple back surgeries along with other surgeries at the age of 27. He's not someone you're looking to draft next year in fantasy football, in my opinion, even if the reports are good, because I feel like every season we go into the year with like Tyler Eifert, you know, the reports are good, he looks healthy, and all of a sudden it's like, he did. So I'm not, I'm staying away from Tyler Eifert, definitely. I mean, but again, he'll be a high upside pick late, late in the draft. He's a, it's a high upside pick with very low probability of hitting that high upside. So uh, don't be investing in hell of real estate in my man's Tyler Eifert. So. Sorry to see it go. Such a good talent, but, you know, injuries are a real thing, and, and they've plagued him throughout his career. So, And lastly, we have Trey Burton of the Philadelphia Eagles. It's been buried underneath the uh, depth chart because you got your boy Zach Ertz breaking out this year and really doing his damn thing. Burton is a super talented, super athletic tight end, and he displayed real tight end one upside a few times this year, right? Especially when Ertz wasn't on the field. There was two games that Ertz missed this year. It was Week 9 and Week 14. In those two games, Burton caught seven passes for 112 yards, but more importantly, he caught three touchdowns in those two games, and he was heavily utilized in those games, and uh, it's something that he could do for another for another team. He's like 6'3", 235 pounds. He's built like a Vernon Davis type guy, right? He's a little slimmer as a tight end, but that's what you see nowadays. You see the teams going with a more athletic, quicker guy who could spread the seams a little bit kind of tight end, and that's what he could do for another team. So. Um, he caught 23 passes all of 2017. Five of them were touchdowns. That's 22% of his catches. And that's what you're going to get with him, right? You're going to get a guy that can not only stretch the field and can give you speed up the middle, but he's a good red zone target as well. So it's going to be an interesting offseason for the tight end position overall. If Burton can land in a spot where he is like the starting tight end and they're saying, you know, he's going to be the receiving tight end there. I'm uh, I'm already telling you, I already know that he's going to be one of my top tight end sleepers for 2018, and he's going to be someone who's getting underdrafted, underutilized um, in fantasy drafts next year. Like He's going to be one of those guys you can get at like round 8 or 10 with really high breakout upside. So stay stay looking out for Trey Burton, because he's going to be, he'll, he'll be uh, in a lot of my videos, I bet. He'll be like Jack Doyle of last year, except assuming that he goes to a place with a normal quarterback. And, uh, and, and, you know, obviously I, that was a prediction based on Andrew Luck being healthy. So you can't predict that kind of stuff. But I really like Trey Burton. And, uh, and, and that's going to end the video here, boys. So if you enjoyed the video, again, please scroll down a little bit. Give it that thumbs up. Let me know in the comment section what kind of videos you want to see this offseason, fantasy football related or anything else related. And subscribe to the channel if y'all are new. You can go follow me on Twitter. You can go follow me on Instagram, all that kind of shit. And uh, come show me some love. So I'll see y'all, well, Saturday will be my next video. So I'll see y'all then.